If you have migraine, cluster, or other headache disease, the coronavirus COVID-19 worldwide health emergency is going to radically change your headache care. We talk about why and what you can do to protect your life and the lives of other people in today's special double edition of The Headache Channel. Welcome back to The Headache Channel. I'm Dr. Alexander Krobe. I'm a full-time board-certified headache medicine doctor, and I've helped thousands of people living with headache live better. This video is one of a special double edition of The Headache Channel. In this video, we will look at why the coronavirus COVID-19 worldwide health emergency is radically changing your headache care as we know it, and we will take a look at the single most important thing that people can do to protect their lives and the lives of others. In the companion video, we will look at the five most important ways that the coronavirus epidemic is changing headache care as we know it. I will put a link to the companion video in the description below and at the end of this video. In both of these videos, I am going to be talking frankly about content that may be upsetting to sensitive viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. If you see a button down there that says subscribe, click it now. Subscribing to the Headache Channel will give you access to this video and other useful videos to help you keep your headaches under control during this worldwide health emergency. So we've already seen a lot of changes in just the past few days, and believe me, there are many more changes to come. Many of those changes will not be pleasant or what we would hope for, but it often helps to understand why the changes have to happen. There's really one major reason why we have to change quickly in response to the COVID-19 crisis, and that is that when a brand new infectious disease like COVID-19 first shows up in a community of people or animals who has never had it before, it can spread like wildfire. Many of us understand how smallpox brought by European explorers decimated native people in places like North and South America and Australia. We also know how the populations of cave bats and honeybees are in danger because of newly introduced diseases. A virus like COVID-19 will spread until we reach a point called herd immunity. Herd immunity happens when enough people have developed immunity to a disease because either they have had it and survived or because they have been vaccinated. The number of people required to achieve herd immunity depends a lot on factors including how easily the disease is spread and how long a person has the disease before they either survive or die. For the coronavirus, COVID-19, experts have estimated that we need around 50 to 70 percent of us to be immune to COVID-19 to achieve herd immunity. And since a vaccine is 18 months or more away, it is inevitable that 50 to 70 percent or more of us will be infected by the coronavirus. Of those of us who catch coronavirus, about 95 percent will have only mild or moderate symptoms, and some of us won't even know that we're sick. But 5% of people who catch coronavirus will be so sick they need hospital care. The critical thing is the time that this takes to happen. How many people are severely sick at any one time has the biggest effect over how many of us will die. If we all get sick at once, what happens is shown in red. The thing to point out is the dashed horizontal line, healthcare system capacity. If you wanted to think of just one thing that represents this line, it's the number of ventilators that we have. If the number of people getting sick increases faster than we can take care of them, the people in the red curve above the dashed line are going to die. If we want to keep people from dying because we don't have enough ventilators to take care of them, we have to slow down the speed at which people get infected by COVID-19. This is called flattening the curve, and the result is shown in blue. Flattening the curve doesn't change the overall number of people getting sick. The number of people who get sick is still the same. It's kind of like rush hour. In normal times, the number of people who commute doesn't change much. If everyone leaves work at the same time, the resources, the roads, get overwhelmed. But if some people leave work early and some people leave work late, we spread out the total number over a much longer time and the roads don't get jammed. So if we spread the number of people who get very sick from COVID-19 over many weeks or many months, we won't ever run out of ventilators, nurses, doctors, or other resources, and we won't have to make hard choices. So what does this look like in terms of actual numbers? Well, there are about 350 million Americans, and at least 50% of people may get coronavirus COVID-19. That's about 175 million people. Now remember, 
almost all, 95% of people, will have no mild or moderate symptoms that they can take care of at home, but 5%, or roughly 9 million people, will be so sick they need to be in the hospital, possibly in the intensive care unit, on a ventilator. And we have less than 200,000 ventilators in the United States. While we're on the subject, a lot of people are confused about the difference between ventilators and respirators. This is a ventilator. It's basically an air pump that pumps air in and out of the lungs of someone who is too weak or too sick to breathe on their own. It helps the person take in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. And this is a respirator. A respirator is just a very good face mask. N95 respirators filter 95% of most contaminants from the air. There are also even more efficient respirators. In normal situations, respirators are considered disposable. They get thrown away after every patient dozens of times a day. But the COVID-19 crisis is not a normal situation. Supplies of respirators are so short that doctors, nurses, and other caregivers have to wear the same respirator for two or more days in a row. So now you know how bad things are, and how bad they could get. This is a matter of life or death. Let's talk about social distancing. Social distancing is the best way that you can help save lives, and remember that the life you save could be your own. Social distancing. Really difficult in this society. It means you have to avoid things like the gym, you have to avoid daycare, you can't go to school, maybe you have to stay at home and work from home. Why don't we just take all of the sick people and isolate them, and the rest of us can just carry on as usual? The reason is that infected people can have no symptoms for up to around 14 days, and many have only mild symptoms that people confuse for allergies or a mild cold. We will never be able to identify all of the infected people unless we have enough tests, and we will not have enough COVID-19 tests for the foreseeable future. Another way to avoid social distancing could be to just have everyone wear a mask and carry on as usual, but the problem is that this virus can probably spread like very fine particles of dust in the air, and the average person does not have the skill or the equipment to stop that kind of viral transmission. Now let's take a look at two simulations that you can find on the Washington Post website. The first video is what happens if a virus gets loose in a community that keeps doing things as usual. Going to school, going to the store, going to the gym or the salon, playing at daycare, and going to the doctor. Uninfected people are shown as green dots. Just like with COVID-19, the infected people, shown as red dots, don't even know they're sick yet. They keep moving around the community, infecting other people, and so on. The number of sick people rises really quickly, overwhelming health resources. In this simulation, however, they don't show anyone dying. After a time, the sick people recover, the red dot turns pink, and they can't get sick again. In the second video, seven of every eight people in the community practice social distancing. They stay at home and don't go out. Again, uninfected people are green dots. They turn red when they are infected and pink when they recover. In this simulation, the virus doesn't kill anyone. One in every eight people is still moving around the community, either because they need to, like their critical care doctors and nurses or first responders, or because they want to. In this case, Everyone still gets infected eventually and recovers eventually, but the process is drawn out over a much longer time, and there are plenty of healthcare resources to take care of everyone. In a real virus like COVID-19, social distancing can not only reduce the demand on ventilators, it can buy time for treatments and cures. Let's take a look at these two scenarios again side by side to see the difference. Social distancing is the most important thing any one person can do to save their own life and the lives of others in this crisis. Let's take a look at social distancing tips for people who are sick. Stay at home unless it's a matter of life or death for you or someone else. If you feel sick or have a fever, stay at home unless you absolutely need to see a doctor. Cover your cough or sneezes with whatever you can as long as you can clean it and it's not your hand. Wear a mask, bandana, or scarf over your nose and mouth. Isolate yourself in one room away from anyone else who lives in your home. If you need to share a bathroom, disinfect it before and after use. Turn off your central air circulation if you can. If you or someone you care for is so sick you have to get medical care, call ahead for instructions. What about social distancing for people who aren't sick? It's pretty similar. Stay at home, save a life. 
Go out at most every 7 to 10 days. Many supermarkets have home delivery for free or for a nominal fee. Maintain a 6-foot bubble or box around yourself, away from everyone else, and try to help everyone else do the same. Try not to share the same 6-foot space with anyone else for longer than a minute or so. When shopping, please try to buy only enough food and supplies to last until your next outing. Remember that other people need to survive too. When you get home, it's not a bad idea to change out of your street clothes and wash them right away, have a shower, wipe down your purchases, and wash your hands. One last tip. If you're running low on disinfectant wipes, remember that you can use regular household bleach by following the dilution instructions on the bottle. For example, you can take one ounce or two tablespoons of regular Clorox bleach and add 32 ounces or one liter of water. Put this in a spray bottle. You can spray surfaces or objects, leaving the spray on for at least five minutes. If you want to, you can let it air dry, in which case it will leave a white residue that is sodium chloride or table salt, or you can rinse it and let it air dry. In this video, we talked about the who, when, and why of our response to the coronavirus COVID-19 global pandemic. The who is us, the when is now, and the why is to save lives. We also talked about how social distancing is the only practical way that we can win this battle against COVID-19 together. This video is one of a double special edition of the Headache Channel. In the companion video, we will talk about five specific ways that COVID-19 will dramatically change what you and your doctor are doing for your headaches during this pandemic. Please remember that the Headache Channel is for information and entertainment purposes only. It is not medical advice. If you need medical advice, please see your doctor. Please take a moment now to subscribe to the Headache Channel. You can either click the subscribe button down there or click the channel logo. Here's a link to the companion video in this series. I'm Dr. Alexander Krobe. Stay home and save a life. See you next time.